What's up guys, it's Data Dave here and yo, just here to review and talk about the rising of a shield hero. So I'm going to quickly give a very small summary for those that haven't seen it and for those that have seen it, we're going to go right into it. So starting out, the rising of a shield hero is about a college student, normal college student, 20 years old, Awatani Naofumi. He was reading a book called The Records of the Four Cardinal Weapons and from reading that somehow he was summoned into this fantasy world as the shield hero along with three other heroes at level one. Their goal is to actually fend off the waves that have been fighting and destroying the kingdom recently, and as the four heroes, they need to end this calamity as a whole. Now, what makes it more interesting without going in depth, is from episode one alone, you find out that through a series of unfortunate events, now Fumi not only loses all of his honor, his money, his reputation, he loses everything and nobody likes him. Now the reason why, you need to watch the anime to find out, but it's basically how Naofumi will actually be able to overcome all of this and become a rising, the risen shield hero in a sense. That's a summary, so I'll give you a chance to watch it and tune back into this review. For those that have seen it, yo, I'm talking about episodes 1 through 3, primarily 3 because that's up to date, but I will touch on a bit of episode 1 and 2 since this will be my first review of the series. So starting out episode 1, the dark spin on this series was amazing because like honestly out of all the anime I've seen, this has been the most character development I've seen done in 20 to 30, I think that first episode was 40 minutes. The most character development I've ever seen. Cause our main character started off so hopeful man, like he reminded me of Naruto or like Asta or even like Natsu from Fairy Tale. and the fact that he was so enthusiastic, like I'm in a new world, I can level up, this is really cool, I'm encouraged, we can do this, you know what I mean? Like he was so like, yo, you got hope in his eyes. And by the end of the episode, he's a whole nother hurt person. He's tough, he's hardened, he's changed. Like, he's more like a Wolverine in, like, the Marvel sense, you know, X-Men sense. You know, it was like, wow, like, this is a major shift of tone and where we end up going in episode two. I love that. I really, really love that because I was like, dang, you know, this needed to happen because how could he have made it in the... Well, he might have been able to make it with help, like the other heroes and how hopeful they are. But I just think it's just cool to see, despite his unfortunate circumstance, it's really cool to see how much he's changed that quick to become a more interesting character instead of a stereotypical shonen one. To go a step further, like let's think about episode two. He enlists a slave for help, a slave demi-human, Ralph Talia, which I really got a lot to say about her, especially after episode three. He used a slave for help from a slave trader. Like what, like, what main character would do that? In this case, he would, and he needed to, especially as a S.H.I.E.L.D. hero. So that was another darker spin, and I was like, wow, like, okay, this show is kind of real. But before I talk about the amazing Ralph Talia, I want to talk about this bitch. I do not like Mine Sophia, right? So, couple things on her before we talk about the most popular thing from episode one. First off, I think Mine, call me crazy, I really think Mine plays a bigger role in the story than we think, maybe. The main reason why is when now Fumi actually was reading the book. This is the second time I saw episode one to make sure I knew what I was talking about. When he was reading the book, he talked about, you know, the spearman, the swords guy, the shield hero, and transporting them. But he also said, yo, the princess in this book isn't even fine. So I blame the outro from this. But if you look at the outro and you look at Mine's hair and what she's wearing, and you look at the actual book of like the silhouette of the princess he mentioned, it looks just like Mine. So I'm pretty sure she's somehow princess or she's somehow royalty because it's just like, okay, this is too coincidental. Why would they highlight this? Why would Mine be a part? Now, where my prediction goes further is I want to say like maybe the king doesn't know he has her as a daughter. Maybe she's not even related to the king. She could have been like, you know, she could have been, you know, the king could have had a daughter with a lady and the lady never told the king he had a daughter. That's one revenue, that's one, or at least that's one avenue. I don't know, but somehow she's going to play a bigger role in this series, in my opinion. I don't know, let me know what you all predict about it, but I think she's somehow tied to the bigger plot and the royalty or something. Because, like, either that or the fact that she's just wanted to get some new armor, get some coin by faking rape in a sense and calling out Fumi that. Like, that was, that was really messed up what she did to him. Why she did it, maybe she wanted to come up 
in the world. Maybe she was poor, you know what I mean? Maybe she was the king's daughter and she needed money or she needed to come up in the world. She looked pretty okay off as an adventurer, but the only reason I feel like the king doesn't really know about her is because why would he have his daughter out there fighting with other heroes as an adventurer? I don't see that happening without any recognition or at least any like sign that the king knew her. So I don't know, there's something with her, but I'm going to say she's a princess whether by the king or someone else. My prediction could be wrong, but I don't like it at all. I don't like it at all. I was messed up what she did. Leading to going on to episode two, let's talk about Ralph Talia. Wow, one, I didn't expect him to actually recruit help from a slave trader and pick her. Well, we kind of knew she was going to pick her when they highlighted it at the end of the episode and the intro and such. But like, dang, man, she really went through it. She had like the chain collar around the neck, the slave seal put on her. You know what I mean? She was terrified of fighting because monsters took out her mother and father and her village. And she had to live through that kind of life. Like that was kind of crazy. Now, another thing that caught me off guard, especially at the beginning of episode two, was the fact that after Nalfumi actually recruited her and took her out, he treated her coldly, especially in front of the weaponsmith guy. But he treated her coldly initially. I was like, dang, you know, I thought he was going to bring her out and just be nice to her. Now, th as the episode went on, he was being nice to her. He was getting her physically ready and fit and mentally ready to fight. Lo and behold, we saw that she just really struggled with it. She struggled killing monsters. She struggled battling. And he was trying to explain to her, you can be my sword. I need your help. And it really wasn't working. When they were fighting that Cerebus like monster, you know, the multi-headed dog being, like, I really like the fact that he could have used the slave order, a slave command. For those that don't know, when you have someone enslaved to you, you can command them to do something. I really like that initially he was like, alright, attack for me, and it was taken over and making her do it, and then he was like, no, just run away. You know, and she thought about it for a second, she was about to, but she came on her own to actually kill the beast. The reason why that needed to happen is because at that moment, she decided on herself that she would become his sword, she would fight, and she would look out for all the other kids and all the other people that the waves and other monsters hurt. If that didn't happen, she never would have became what she finally became in episode 3, which is really what we really want to speak on because I love the change and differences that happened. Episode 1 and 2, very solid, they got me interested. Episode 3 has me like, I need to talk about this series. Well, episode 3, you all seen it. The waves finally attacked. Now Fumi went into action. The other heroes went into action. And we saw the different roles that they played. And we saw that now Fumi actually defended the village because he valued... Well, not because he valued people's life, but he was more focused on protecting people, which isn't ironic because that man is the shield hero. But like, you know, he was like, okay, we gotta save the villagers, help them evacuate. Raftalia, by the way, is much larger and much bigger. Like she's grown. I don't think she's grown mentally, maybe she might have, but physically she's definitely taller. One weird thing though, it was funny that now Fumi was like, there's a lot of lollicons in these cities. Like, does he not see how much or acknowledge how much she's grown? Like, she's literally standing at his height, but I don't know. Maybe she matured or wised up because I realized that she's more confident, she speaks up, even he picked up on that a bit, and she's just a little bit more perky. She's the one saying, yo, if you don't equip yourself with some more gear, you're gonna be the one to die. She like turned the sword and stuff. So like, I like this. Ralph Talia now, like, you know, she's cool. She went from that person that was unconfident in episode two to this whole new likable individual in episode three. That was really dope. But to go back to the village, it was really cool that now Fumi actually protected the villagers despite his words. Like, let me talk about now Fumi and his words. Like, honestly, this character is a true definition of action speak louder in words. Look at how he talked to the knights being like, you know, well, you could die here. I really wouldn't care. He said that, but he said that while he was defending the knight that was being an asshole to him and blocking his shot, blocking the uh, hits for him and protecting the soldier and getting Ralph Talia to fight. Do you know what I mean? He's telling the knights, yeah, you can run, but he's also defending them, telling them to get information and that he'll lure them around. For the villagers, he told them to like flee, you know what I mean? They ran, like I got this, I'll lure and aggro everybody. But when the villagers came back, which was pretty nice, I like that scene, he's like, okay, fight for your village, let's do it together, you know? So like, now Fumi, despite how badly he's been treated this entire series, he's still kind. His actions is being like way, his actions show how great of a character he actually is despite everything he says. 
Even in episode two, when he was cold to Ralph Talia, he was cold to her because he needed a fighter. He needed her to get tougher, and he needed to figure out a way to help her get better. You know what I mean? Like, but at the end of the day, he was buying her kids' meals because he knew that she looked like she was interested in it. He fed her, he clothed her, he looked out for her, got her arm and equipped. You know what I mean? So like, now Fumi, like, you, if you can look past his words. His actions really, really, really speak louder. And that's what I really love about Nafumi. That despite all of this, you're a kind-hearted person. You're just not going to say that you're kind-hearted and looking out for people. You may feel hurt, but you still choose to be kind to others. That made him a really dope character. But I fell off a I fell off my subject a little bit. But the one thing that I really do love about this episode is despite all the rumors, despite all the things that have been said about Nafumi that's bad, even the fact that the knights even tried to attack him when he was in the line of fire of monsters, the fact that the villagers said, thank you for saving us. He was all like, nah, thank the lucky stars I was around, or this happened and that you're alive. The villager was like, no, thank you, because you actually went and helped us, and we acknowledge that, and you encouraged us to fight for our village. That scene, really that whole sequence of this whole episode showed me what I feel now Fumi's role is in the show. Now Fumi's role in this show is as a shield hero to defend the people. And like everybody he probably meets, interact with, will know his reputations, the rumors of his affairs with Mine, and other things, his bad reputation. But despite that, they're going to see his actions despite the words they hear to say you know what he's actually an amazing shield hero and great guy he's gonna be the guy that you know i won't take credit for what's done but you saw what i did for somebody and that's why you like me you know what i mean he's probably not even gonna be looking for that recognition of money in my prediction like i feel like he has to him and ralph Tilia both have to ralph talia have to both prove themselves worthy of others even if they're trying versus really they're just not even versus they have to prove themselves worthy despite the circumstances because they're already disliked. Ralph Talia, she's a demi human, so like, you know, people already don't like her. They had a sign outside the restaurant in the kingdom that said we don't serve demi humans. So, segregation in that sense and demi humans are slaved in that world. Like, or not world, but in that kingdom. You know, I'm sure there exists a land where they can live because Ralph Talia's mother and father lived in the village, you know? So, like, there's somewhere they could be, but in that kingdom. They just looked down upon. But overall, this was a very good episode. I like what happened. It's cool to see the world in this RPG-like state. Like the fact that the shield hero now, Fumi, is learning new skills by absorbing items, new shields. Like he's going to obviously unlock more and more and more. Valtali is going to level up more and more. And that's just the crew right now. And like it seems dope. I feel like maybe next episode as a prediction, maybe they'll recruit somebody else. Now that they've handled the first wave and all this has been done, it's time for them to get more equipment or time for them to get more abilities or like, you know, it's like, I don't know. I don't know where they can go next. I know that at the end, the other heroes were thanked by the knights and the king is going to throw a feast. I don't think now Fumi's going to get invited, especially since he was kicked out of the kingdom. But he's just like, all right, on to the next. Let's get some more skills, abilities, let's equip her and let's keep leveling up for the next fight. Or let's recruit a new ally. Granted, I don't know who would actually join him that's a person because he has such a horrible reputation amongst the people. Maybe somebody from the village somehow. We'll see. But let me know what you all think about the next episode, what you got predictions on, and how do you feel about the series as a whole. One more thing I did forget to touch on is the other heroes. It's still too early for me to say much about them because I really don't know much about them. This episode, these three episodes focused heavily on the shield hero. But just to say what I feel about each character, I feel like the sword hero is pretty cool. Like he has that cool guy atmosphere, that logical technical feeling. The archer seems like the happy-go-lucky fighter. Like, you know, maybe he's really smart or tactical in a sense also. The spear guy, you know, that's the cool guy, ladies man individual. Like, I feel like him and the shield hero will probably never get along for the fact that Mine, you know, the girl that betrayed uh, Naofumi, is actually in his party so she's gonna be feeding him lies so with her feeding him lies there's no way that he would like the shield hero anytime soon in my book so it's not it's not like i dislike the, the uh, spearman hero right now but it's just i don't see you being treating i don't see you treating now fumi decently when you have the girl that played him in your party you know so we'll see i think he's not 
smart enough to try to play Nafumi because Nafumi did believe that he and her put together this plan to betray and play him for his money and make his reputation bad. Like I don't see this legendary spear hero being that kind of guy. Like I feel like he'd be too honorable or prideful to do something like that. I could be wrong. But let me know what you think. And yo, so far with just these three episodes, The Rising of a Shield Hero is really decent. I like it. And let me know how you feel. But yo, thank you for tuning in to another review in the database. I look forward to reviewing this content weekly. And yo, have a good one. See you later, guys. And see you around.